Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, random matrix theory, uh, a particular part of random matrix theory. Okay, and so random matrix theory, for those of, uh, of you who know, is, is a very vast area of research with a lot of applications, many, many results, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So try to give, to cover some of these topics in two weeks would be very foolish from my part. Okay, so what I'm going to do instead, I'm going to be selfish and I'm going to focus on the work I've done. Okay, and the work I've done essentially could be summarized in a title, which is the title of this lecture, which is the statistical mechanics of random matrices. By the way, I'm going to, I'm going to use the, the blackboard all the time. Is that that's okay with you? Yeah. So the title of this, uh, of this course is going to be Statistical Mechanics of Random Matrices. Even a particular type of random matrix at some point, but we'll see this thing later on. And what is the main goal of these lectures I'm going to give you? I'm going, I'm going to try to give you some very, very cool tools to solve this problem. So, okay, I'm not going to focus on universal results, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. So, what I'm going to do is, is, or the main, the main goal of this uh, series of lectures is the following. Let me put it here. So, the main goal would be. Something like the following. And actually, this happens not only in, in random matrix theory, it happens also in, in, in other areas of, uh, of science, like, for instance, economy, ecology, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So I'm interested in a problem in random matrix. Uh, here, a problem of interest concerning random matrices. I don't know, whatever, okay? Maybe you come from different areas, you have various different interests, yeah? And what I'm going to do, I'm going to map, okay, exactly this problem into a problem in StackMech. StackMech of uh, disorder systems, also called for the people uh, in the know spin glasses, right? StackMech of disorder systems. Can you understand my writing? I hope so. Yeah? And the people, the last part you can see it? Very well. Right, so I'm going to do this mapping. This mapping essentially is exact, okay, from the beginning. Yeah, so I have a very interesting problem in random matrix theory, or random matrices. I map it exactly to a problem in, in stack make with a partition function, a free energy, et cetera, et cetera. And then what I, what I do here, once I realize that my problem can be understood in the setup of physics, what I'm going to do is to apply all the machinery I know from physics to solve the problem. Right? And what is the ma this machinery? Well, so this machinery would be, so number one, of course, concepts and ideas of, of well, the foundations of statistical mechanics, no? partition function, free energies, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I will, use it, I will be using things about of a stack mech. Stack mech, and these are the idea of a, what is a partition function. What are free energies? Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah? So this part, I will not cover it because I assume that everybody knows the basic of the statistical mechanics. Am I correct on thinking that? Yeah? Very good. Then I will be using some tools of disorder systems. And again, disorder system spin glass is a very vast area with many cool results. The physics is very interesting, and that gave rise to the Nobel Prize in Physics, one part, to Giorgio Paris in 2021, if I recall correctly. Okay? So I'm not going to go into details of what are spin glasses, the, the physics behind them. That what I'm interested here in these lectures, very short lectures, is to use the tools developed to understand spin glasses to solve problems of interest in random matrices. Okay? So which are those tools? Those tools is what is called replica method that may, I guess you, some of you have heard about. Who knows the idea of replica method? Raise your hands. And the rest you don't know, that's very good. So I have something to teach. New. The other method is called cavity method. Okay. And maybe for other, 
very advanced uh, results uh, on random matrices, you would use other techniques, but I'm going to focus on those. Okay? Good so far? Good, and then uh, I need some basic results from mathematics, okay? Tools from mathematics. Let me see that I'm not, miss I, I'm not missing anything. All right, then I need some tools. Uh, coming from mathematics, okay? One tool is a very important tool that every student from physics should know, but sometimes you don't know, which is okay, which is uh, the so-called side point method. Okay? This is a very cool method that is used, actually, it's, it's, it's a cornerstone in a many, many results in, a, in condensed matter physics quantum field theory, okay? So one tool, one tool I need to explain to you is the saddle point method. This is also called the Laplace method or the steepest descent method or the stationary phase approximation method. It depends on the, on the context, but this method is also called Laplace method. or the steepest descent method, or the stationary phase approximation method. Stationary phase approximation method. The, all these concepts are used synonymously, even though it is not true, okay, for a specific type of mathematical problem, you will, you, what you should call it is either steepest or Laplace, depending on the other problem, it's called either uh, the side point method or the, or the stationary phase approximation, right? Have you heard about this, this method? I, I hope so. Very good. Then uh, we'll need some uh, results of uh, Gaussian integrals, okay, uh, multivariate Gaussian integrals, which again, uh, there are many, many results very important in, in QFT or FT, generally speaking. Here, I'm worried about expressing determinants in terms of multivariate Gaussian integrals. All right? And finally, I need some uh, very uh, simple results of expressing Dirac deltas, Dirac deltas and theta functions in a smart ways, okay? That's it. Questions so far? Nothing? Okay, so, how I'm going to, or how I thought I could structure these lectures? Let me see. So the way to structure them is going to be the following. This is going to be the content. Okay, so first week. Well, I have to say that I, I teach a lot, okay, but I, I never manage to follow my, my, own, my own schedule. It's impossible. I don't know why. I'll, I'll try to do that, okay? So first week, uh, day one. So this is what I'll try to do. Day one, we are going to uh, introduce the, the mathematical tools, okay? This is today. Uh, second day, second and third day, days one, three. Uh, tools of spin glasses, that would be replica, and cavity methods. Okay. Days four and five. We'll do the mappings. We'll set up into deciding which problems we think they're interested in random matrices. And then we'll do the mappings to problems in statistical mechanics. Okay? So mappings. So in particular, I think I'm going to focus on. No, we'll do it generally. 
Okay. General Muppets. Or as general as possible. Okay, and then in week number two, second week, in days one and two, we'll focus on a spectral, uh, spectral density of uh, random graphs, directed and indirected random graphs of random graphs. Then days three and four, we, we will develop what is called large deviation theory for this type of problems. Um, large deviation theory for this type of problems. And of course, uh, day five is the exam. Good. Questions. Now, the most important question is about the exam, I guess, right? What I'm going to put in the exam, I need to think about it, okay? But as Mateo mentioned, it's going to be very, very, very tough, all right? Very good. So, shall we start? Yeah, excellent. So, let's start with day one which is today, which is mathematical tools. So, okay, before, uh, while I'm erasing, can somebody tell me something about the, what, uh, what is known as the saddle point method? What is the idea behind the saddle point method? Somebody? It's a way of, uh, calculating integrals without having to do the integral, okay? That's very cool because everybody knows how to do derivations, but nobody knows how to do integrals, right? So it's much, much more difficult to do integrals. So the idea of the side point method as, uh, what's your name? Christopher? Christopher. Is to uh, do integrals, okay? Actually do or evaluate the, the integrals in a particular case. So, so let me see. This is uh, some mathematical tools. We start with the saddle point method. Also known, as I told you, like a, the Laplace method or steepest descent method or stationary method approximation. All right? So the idea is the following. So suppose I have an integral of the following sort. I'm going to denote this integral as uh, I sub n, and this is equal to the integral from, for instance, from A to B, the exponential and minus and f of x, okay? And what I want to study is what is called the asymptotic behavior of this integral when n goes to infinity. I'm not interested, if I could, that would be very cool, okay? <laughs> that would be much, much, much better, but you know, sometimes if you're interested in the asymptotic behavior of things, like this, pass, uh, this happens in st statistical mechanics where you're interested in the thermodynamic limit, right? So here, I want to study the asymptotic behavior. Let us put it here. Behavior of this integral when n goes to infinity. Okay. So for those of you who know the side point method, you know that uh, the result is that <coughs> When n goes to infinity, or for m very, very large, the asymptotic behavior of this integral, and the, the notation is like this. I'll explain what this thing means precisely. Is the exponential of minus n f of x0, where x0 is such that the derivative of f at x equal to x0 is 0, and the second derivative of x of f of x at x equal to x0 is positive. Okay? And what this symbol means, this means, uh, you know, physicists, we use, uh, we confuse the symbols, okay? All the time we use the, 
And I, I'm going to do that a lot, okay? But at least this symbol means the following. What this, symbols, was, what, what this symbol means, means that if I take the limit of I sub n, uh, if I take the limit, sorry, of the one over n, the logarithm of I sub n, okay, and going to infinity, let me put here a minus sign, this is equal to f of x zero. Yeah? This symbol, what it means is this limit. Correct? Good, so how, I, how, how do I prove that? Do you know? Taylor expansion, okay? And if you know this method and you do properly the Taylor expansion, here what appears is, you know, the, 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 the starting point of, of uh, perturbation theory, theory Feynman diagrams, et cetera, et cetera, is, is simply a tail, Taylor expansion, okay? So what I do is, uh, I do, let us do it for those people that who do not know this method. So it, it, this is a proof, it's an informal proof, it's not a mathematical proof, okay? So I take the, the function f of x, I do a Taylor expansion around x zero. So since the, the first derivative is zero, okay? And by the way, here I forget, I forgot something, you have to assume that x zero, where you have the minimum is between the integration interval, okay? If it's outside the integration interval, then you have to generalize this result, and the result is called Watson theorem. Okay, we're going to assume that x zero is between a and b. Uh, so you have that f of x is equal to f of x zero plus uh, one half of the second derivative of this function x minus x zero squared plus the sum for n greater or equal than three undivided by n factorial, the nth derivative of f of x zero x minus x zero, n. all right? So I put this, this thing apart because that's the important term. So then what I do is simply I put this result in the integral. What I have, I have that I sub n is equal to the integral from a to b in the x, exponential of what? Of minus f of f of x zero minus n divided by two, second derivative of f at x zero, x minus x zero squared, minus sum for n greater or equal than three, capital N divided by N factorial, the N derivative of the function evaluated at x zero, x minus x zero to the power. Now, this term is a constant, it can get out. Can you follow my writing, everything's okay? Yeah. So this, this, this guy, I can take it out, so then I'll have this equal to the exponential of minus n f of x zero, and I have the integral from a to b dx, and then I have the rest, no? Exponential of minus n divided by two, second derivative of the function evaluated at x zero, x minus x zero square, and the rest I'm going to call it, I don't know, plus r of x. And what I do, I can do this thing in many ways. I can, well, I can proceed in several ways. One way would be I do a change of variables. I denote I y is equal to the square root of n x minus x zero. So then I have that this integral is equal, is equal to the exponential of minus n f of x zero. And then in the change of variables, what, what do I have? I have the square root of n a minus x zero, the square root of n b minus x zero, half the y divided by the square root of n, exponential of minus one half of second derivative of f at x zero, y the square, and then let me put it like here. Here I have the exponential of r tilde of y, okay? So at, at r tilde of y is this, when I do the change from x to y. Just work it out. And the next step you can do is the following. So this is equal to the exponential of minus n f of x zero. And then, so let me see. Uh, this would be the integral, the same integral, square root of n a minus x zero, the 
square root of n b minus x zero dy square root of n exponential of minus one half second derivative of f evaluated at x zero y square. And here I do a Taylor expansion. Yeah? It's equal to uh, the sum of the series from n for n from zero to infinity of one divided by n factorial n factorial r tilde to the power n y. Right. Good. Questions so far? Oh, so then what happens? Okay, so what happens if you look at the the leading term? Oh, if you look at thank you. If you look at the leading term in n, so the leading term, the, 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 the one that is the important one in the limit of n goes to infinity comes from here, okay? When n goes to infinity or for very large n, the integral goes from minus infinity to infinity. Why? Because a is from between a, sorry, x zero is between a and b, okay? So this is negative, this is negative, and when n goes to infinity, this goes to minus infinity and this to plus infinity. And you can look at the collections to n of this part, but, but they are not exponentially big. Okay? So, in field theories, you would call that this is, you can look at these results in the book of San Justin, for instance. This in field theory, when you do this test of, of derivations, would, this would be a Gaussian measure. Yeah, you have a Gaussian probability distribution. This would be a Gaussian measure. And these are the terms that come from perturbation theory. So that means that the leading contribution, the one we are interested in, the leading term, would be the following one. Uh, would be the exponential of minus n f of x zero, and then the integral from minus infinity to infinity, the dy square root of n exponential of minus uh, second derivative divided by 2y squared times 1, okay? You take the, the zero of terms in this part. And this is a Gaussian integral, right? So therefore, you get that this is equal to exponential of minus n f of x zero, and this is the square root of uh, 2 pi second derivative of f of x zero divided by n. Questions? Yeah, you assume that it's between A and B. Okay. I, I, I said at the beginning, I just erased it. Yeah? So if, if X0, so X0 has to be between A and B. Okay, in such a way with that when you do this integral, this integral goes from minus infinity to infinity. If this were not be the case, if you have that x0 is not between a and b, then you can generalize this result and the, the theorem is called Watson theorem. But for our cases, or the case of interest, our x0 is always within a and b. Or, or as a physicist, you assume that it's between a and b and you do the derivation, okay? Watson theorem. More questions? Go ahead. Which one? This? Uh, this this sum here? So this sum here is like since I'm, 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 I'm interested in the leading term in n, okay, the one that contributes to the leading term is when n is equal to zero. The rest of the terms would be the, the corrections to the leading term, which is perturbation theory which if we would have time, I would tell you how to do a perturbation theory for random matrices, but we will not have time. <coughs> More questions? Ooh, ooh, ooh. 
What? Why? Why? I'm doing the integral from minus infinity to infinity. Is it? It's not correct. It, it is correct. No? Ah, this is a one. Sorry. If you don't understand my writing, it, it, this happens. Don't be shy. Yeah. This 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 pretends to be a one. Sorry. <laughs> More questions. Very good. So. Now, sometimes it happens that instead of having a just the exponential of a real function, this function I didn't say, but it's supposed to be real. The argument is real, and the function is a mapping from the reals to the reals. You have a function in the complex plane. Okay, so suppose now. Suppose now that you have, you have the following now. Suppose that f, if for example, sorry, once, once more here. So this function here for the Laplace method is a function from r to r. Okay. So suppose now that I have a function f but in the complex plane. And I have uh, the same type of integral. So I have the integral, which is the integral from a to b. The, of this set exponential of minus f exponential of minus n f of z. Right. So I have in the complex plane I have point, point A, I have point B, and then uh, this align integral in the complex plane, so I have to the I have to choose. Let me choose a path. Although if, if the function is analytical, that the, the result of the integral is independent of, of, of the path. Okay? Choose a path gamma goes from A to B, it's the path, path gamma. And again, you're interested in the asymptotic behavior of this integral when it's going, and goes to infinity. So in this case, you can do the same trick or, go, or, or something very similar. So what you do is you look for a point in the complex plane. Let's say, let's say this is a point set zero. You look at a point in the complex plane such that the derivative of the function evaluated at set zero is zero. Then if the function, if f is analytical, the exponential of minus nf is analytical function, that means that the result of the integral does not depend on the path. So that means I can modify the path as I, as I please. So what I do is, a, is I modify the path to go through set zero. OK, go ahead. The sorry? The second. Ah, because I, I did a mistake. So it should be below. Thank you. Yeah? Yes? Thank you. So what you do now in the case of the complex plane, you assume that yeah, there is a point set zero uh, such that the derivative of f at set zero is zero. So then you take the path, you deform it to go through this point, and then you move the path such, and then you can do the Taylor expansion, etc., etc. Okay? And then when you do the Taylor expansion, there would be, and I'm, I'm going to leave as, this thing as an exercise, you'll have in the Taylor expansion an expression which is the second derivative of the function evaluated at set zero, a times set minus set zero square and higher order terms. So then what you do is you move the path in such a way that the imaginary part of this expression is constant along the path, okay, in a small region. And then you apply the side point method to the real part. So at the end of the day, you obtain exactly the same result, but you have to be smart of, you have to be aware that you have to modify the path, okay? So at the end of the day, you find that the asymptotic behavior of this integral is again the exponential of minus n f of z zero. Okay? Go ahead. It's a result from co complex analysis. If you have a function which is analytical, an analytic function, the, the integral, the line integral in the complex plane does not depend on the path. So I'm assuming here that, okay, I'm assuming here that f of z is an analytic function, therefore the exponential of minus 
they've offset this analytic, analytic function, okay? So here, we are assuming that this function is analytic. I, I only care about, again, about, about the asymptotics, yeah? And since I only care about the asymptotics, I only need to deform the, the, the path a little bit in such a way that the asymptotics, you know, cares just a bit about what happens around this point. More questions? Go ahead. Repeat. Very good. If you have many, if you have many points, this happens also in, in this case. That's a very good point. If you have many points, what you do, you treat, you apply this to the various points. Okay. So you can do this. And actually, in, in, in a stack phase, when you, uh, sometimes it happens that you have an equilibrium state, a metastable state. Metastable states appears when you take into account these uh, different, uh, different minimums. Like, so let me delete here. So if it happens, the following is a very interesting question. Thank you for that. So suppose I have, let's go again to the real case. Okay, suppose I have a function like this. F of x, of something like this. No? Right. When I have one local minimum, let us call this thing x0, uh, zero, x0, zero, one, okay? up to x0 n, yeah? So what you would do when you're integrating over, uh, let us say over the whole line for simplicity. So then I have, again, so I have the integral, i n is equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity of dx exponential of minus n f of x. So what would happen in this case is when n goes to infinity, again, it's asymptotic behavior, this would go like, like the following. This would go like the sum for i from zero to a small n of the square root of two pi n, the second derivative of x zero n, the exponential of minus f n of n of f x zero n. Yeah? Now, sometimes you need to keep the contribution from all minima. But in other, other equations, uh, the only one you're interested in is, uh, you're interested in is, in, the, is in the deepest minima, okay? Suppose that, for instance, I'm going to exaggerate this, this picture. The deepest minima is this one here, okay? X zero n. And then what is going to happen? Well, what is going to happen when n is very large, okay? I can always write this thing as follows. Let me, let me forget about this part, okay? I can write this thing as exponential of minus n f of x zero n, one plus exponential of minus n, let us say x uh, uh, n f of x zero zero minus f of x zero n, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So when n goes to infinity, this is very small. So the most important contribution is the contribution that comes precisely from the deepest minimum, okay? If for some reason, and this happens, actually, Matteo has worked on this application so in you know, inference problems, okay? Sometimes you have to take into account contributions from other minima, and in physics, these are called metastable states. Good, more questions? Go ahead. So we repeat. How do we know? Due to the structure, ah, the subleading term, how do we know that they are not going to change the, the leading behavior? Because they are subleading. They, they don't have the, the form of exponential of n. Okay? So, so you see, no, normally this would be related to a partition function. 
in, in, in a stack map. I'm, I'm always interested in the logarithm of the partition function, which are, is free energy. So whatever which is not exponential in n, in the partition function, in the limit when n goes to infinity, is subleading, and it goes to zero, zero in the thermodynamic limit. Okay? So there might be some case where subleading terms can sum up to exponential contribution, but I don't think so. But I'm not sure. Okay? But you know this, this term is subleading in, in the sense like if I take the logarithm of this expression divided by n, this term would go to zero when n goes to infinity. That was your question? Very good. More questions? Go ahead. This one here? Sure. Again, if you don't understand my writing, please yell at me. I can rewrite it, okay? So the argument is the following. So suppose you have uh, various minima. Uh, if you generalize our derivation, you will get this, okay? But of course, what happens is you have this sum of exponential of minus n, and it happens that if, if, if you look at the behavior when n goes to infinity, the deepest minima is the most important one in most of the cases of interest. So how can I see this? Well, let us, let us forget about this part. This, this is not important, okay, when n goes to infinity. So let me focus on the deepest minima, which is this one here, which I denoted as x, x zero n. And I'll write that expression here. Let me put it here as follows, okay? This goes like the exponential of minus n f of x comma zero n. I take it out, okay? And I subtract the, the arguments of the other exponentials. So then I have one, because it's the term that I take out, plus the exponential of minus n that multiplies f of x zero zero, that would be the first minima, minus f of x zero n, plus the exponential of minus n f of x zero one, minus f x zero n, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then what happens, what happens, this is the deepest minimum, so then any other minimum minus that, or the value of that minimum is positive, and you have a beautiful minus sign. So when n goes to infinity, the important term is the one just extracted. More questions? No, I have to, uh, you have to, if, okay, if you do this derivation, and that's very important that you do the derivations, what happens when instead of having a minimum, you have a maximum? What happens? So the, 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 integral, the integral diverges here, okay? So somehow what you are doing when you are doing this integral, is the following. So you are splitting the integral in the, around the parts where you have minimum and you are forgetting where you, where you have maximums. Okay? Sure. It would be the same. But the second derivative, uh, the second derivative changes sign. And if you go to the derivation of the, of the real case when the function was real, then you have the integral of a Gaussian weight but where the sign is the other way around, so that integral diverges. So it doesn't make any, doesn't make any sense, yeah? So that's why when I did the real case, and I'll leave as an exercise for all of you to do the derivation, it's very important, you have to, for the sign I put here, okay, the second derivative of the function at x zero, when for, for real function, has to be positive. If it's negative, the integral is not well defined. More questions? No questions? Good. Okay, so it's important that you do the, the, the derivation because now, okay, so, to know the, the, the details of, of, of them. Yeah, you have to take, you have to choose a path such, such that the real part has the appropriate sign and the, imagina, the, the path around the imaginary path is constant. If, if it 
less than half. Yeah? Because you, what you want to do is to apply the Laplace method in the complex case. Constant along the path, so it doesn't change. So then you take it out of the integral, yeah? And then you have the real part, yeah? And then the real part, you apply, apply the Laplace method. More questions? No, okay, so, of course, uh, this Laplace method, or steepest descent method, is a very powerful technique. It's used a lot in stack mech. And as you see the structure, it can be easy, easily generalized. Suppose now that I have, again, something like the following, but now I have a multivariate integral, okay? I have the integral. So I have a map from R n to R n. No, from R, R, R n to 1, sorry. I'm doing here the integral over R n. So I have the integral of dnx of the exponential of minus n of x, OK? Where uh, my notation dnx is equal to the product of i from 1 to nd dx i. And again, I'm, in, I'm interested here in, in what? In the asymptotic behavior when n goes to infinity. So if you do the derivation, on the, for those of you who, who didn't know this method, so the derivation is straightforward. Okay? The only thing that you have to be careful about that you are, you, now you have a function of various variables. Okay? So suppose, so here, the result would be and this is equal, oh, pardon, sorry, it goes like exponential of minus n f of x0, where x0, the vector belonging to r n is such that the gradient of f of x applied to x equal to x0 is 0. And when you do the Taylor expansion, in order for the integrals to be def uh, well defined, the Hessian must be definite positive. So that means that the partial derivative with respect to i, with respect to j of f of x evaluated at x equal to x0 has to be definite positive. Okay? So this is the Hessian matrix. Good. Go ahead. No, this is I'm, I'm 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 mixing notation. Lovely. Thank you. So let us call this in a small n. Thank you for the point. And this. Okay. That's a small n. Yeah. Thanks. Where does this condition come from? Do you know? Huh? It's, that's right. Okay. So the, the matrix must be positive definite in such a way that when you do the Taylor expansion, the quadratic term has a positive definite matrix, so the integral is well defined. If not, the integral is not well defined. It blow up. Good. In, a, in this area, when you do this type of derivations, this set of uh, this condition for x0 to be a, an extremum, okay, or sometimes it's called critical point, these are called saddle point equations. These are so called the saddle point equations. Okay? Very good. Questions? Now, be careful because now it's a, it's, it's a function from a, a higher dimensional space to R. Okay? So when you have a critical point or, or, or the stream, you have to classify what type of stream you have. You may, you may, you may 
you can have minimum, maximum, or saddle points. Okay, so to apply this method, the streamum you, you have to take into account must be minimum. Because if there is a saddle point, again, in the direction where you have the maxima, the integral is going to blow up. Okay, so x0, so okay, let me put it here more explicitly. x0 has to be a minimum. Very good, more questions? So sometimes, sometimes when uh, we do this type of derivations, what we, what we do, what we say is the following, okay? So let us assume that it's a minimum, and then you carry on, okay? <laughs> because sometimes to check these things, depending on what you are doing, sometimes to check this thing is very difficult, okay? And normally what happens is like, since you, you are starting from a well-defined well problem, what it would happen is like, this has to be a minimum, because otherwise the, the problem will not be well-defined from the beginning. So essentially, nobody checks that, th those conditions unless you, have, you need those conditions for something else, like, for instance, perturbation theory. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. This one here. Yes. The Hessian matrix, so that means, so this is a matrix now, because it depends on these two indices. This is the Hessian matrix. So when you put that a matrix is greater than zero, that means that the, what you're saying is that the, met, the metric is definitely positive. So that means that, okay, the easiest way to say this thing is like all the eigenvalues are positive. Or another condition is, or, or all the minors are positive, all, all, the, all the minors are positive, definitely, okay? But it's easier to think uh, about this condition with respect to the eigenvalues of the matrix. Yeah? You de-analyze and the, 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 if the eigenvalues are all positive, the positive is definite. The, the matrix, sorry, is positive definite, yeah? More questions? So, okay, so if there are no more questions about um, saddle point methods, saddle point equations, et cetera, et cetera, that I will I'll use a lot. So let us now go to another part, which is uh, multidimensional Gaussian integrals. So again, um, if you take the book of San Justin, for instance, you find a lot of information in there. It's this very thick book that has like a 2,000 pages. This is the black book of uh, condensed matter physics. I, I forgot the title. So, uh, so what I'm interested, I'm interested here is the following. So I want to relate. So I suppose I have a matrix A. It's a n times n matrix. This n has nothing to do with the other n. Okay. And for some reason, in some problem I'm interested, I'm, I'm interested in, the determinant of A appears. Okay? And what I want to do is to write the determinant of the matrix in terms of integrals. So I want to find a way. You'll see why this is useful. I want to find a way to express the thing in terms of Gaussian integrals. So, so let's start then with the simplest case. The simplest case is suppose that the matrix A is, is symmetric, definite positive. And suppose that A, A is uh, real. So the entries are real. It's real, uh, symmetric, and definite positive. Yeah? So one can show that one divided by the square root of the determinant of A is equal to the integral of D and X. Um, yeah, determinant, sorry, the, the integral of D and X divided by two pi to the power and divided by two 
of the exponential of minus one half x a x. Yeah. Sure. Have you? I guess you have seen this. At least the one-dimensional case, no? <laughs> well, and how do you prove this? There are many ways to prove it. There are very cool tricks and very weird tricks. Like, for instance, suppose that the matrix can be divided into the product of the square root of matrices and do a very weird transformation, no? Uh, or there is another simpler one. How do you prove this? Sorry? This is a multivariate Gaussian distribution. Suppose that you want to prove this. Yeah? So, by the way, good point. This is what is called multivariate Gaussian distribution, of course. Okay? It's, missing a, it's missing the mean values, vector mean values, but this is a multivariate Gaussian distribution. You can diagonalize it. Very good. So, the way you diagonalize it is the following, right? We know that since A is a real and symmetric matrix, so that means that it can be diagonalized by, ortho, uh, by an orthogonal transformation. You know, suppose that O. It's a matrix, okay, which is the orthogonal transformation that diagonalizes A, so that the O transpose A O is equal to lambda, okay, where lambda is the matrix diagonal with the eigenvalues of A. Of course, since the matrix A is symmetric, that means that the, that the, the eigenvalues are real, and since I am taking that is definite positive, the eigenvalues are positive. There are no zeros or negative eigenvalues. Right, and then what I do next? What do I do next? I, I do a change of variables, all right? So I say, so what can I say? I say that O, so X is equal to O X prime. Yeah, so I go from X to X prime, where this O is precisely the orthogonal transformation that diagonalizes the matrix. And once I've done that, I do the change of variables, no? Do that, I do the change of variables, and now, so I have, so let's do it step by step, okay? Because then I'll put an exercise which is a bit a deviation of this. Okay, so I have this expression here x transpose a x. I do the change of variables, so the change of variables is that x vector x is O x prime. So that means that this is x vector prime transpose. O transpose A O X vector prime, but this is the diagonal matrix, all right? So this implies that this is equal to well, what I just said, X prime transpose diagonal matrix X prime, but this is equal, let me put it explicitly, this is equal to the sum of I from one to N lambda I X I prime prime square, yeah? I have not done anything that, but I need to, to, you know, at least to go through this for those people that have not seen this. And then, uh, since I'm doing an integral, I have to do the change of variables in the vari uh, integration variables. So, so that means that uh, dx, sorry, dn x is equal to the, uh, the determinant of the Jacobian, uh, the Jacobian of the transformation that normally is denoted like this. Uh, partial of x respect to partial x prime, the determinant dn x prime. This is the, the determinant of the Jacobi, Jacobian of the transformation. But the transformation is an orthogonal transformation. And the determinant is equal to? No, plus minus one. Because the orthogonal transformation can be the standard one or can be, uh, right? Orthogonal transformation can be a reflection, can be a reflection, sorry, can be rotation and rotation and reflection. Reflection has the determinant minus one. The problem is like here in this transformation, you have the absolute value. It's the determinant and the absolute value, okay? So as I know that the determinant of O is plus minus one, so that means one also an absolute value, so the measure doesn't change. So that means that the, this integral here, the integral of dnx, divided by 2 pi 
to the power n divided by 2 of exponential of minus 1 half this is equal to what? This is equal to the integral dnx prime of 2 pi to the power n divided by 2 of the exponential of minus 1 half. I'm going to put it like this, okay? Sum i from 1 to n lambda i x i square. Yeah? And now the, the integral has decoupled into one dimensional Gaussian integrals yeah? because this is equal to the following. I can write this thing as the product of i from 1 to n of the integral. I'm not putting the limits of the integral, and I'm assuming it's from minus infinity to infinity. Sorry about that. Huh? Uh, of dxi divided by square root of 2 pi, the exponential of minus lambda i xi squared divided by 2. Yeah? And this is equal to what? The result of the one dimensional Gaussian integral everybody knows, no? Unless I, I, you do a mistake as I did before, right? This would be a one over the square root of lambda i, yeah? Which is equal to one over the square root of the product of i from one to n of the lambda i's. But the product of the lambda i's is the determinant of lambda, and the determinant of lambda is equal to the determinant of a. Right, so one more step. I, I'm being very explicit with the steps, okay? Just for those of you who have not seen this. So let me continue here. So this is equal to one divided by the square root of the determinant of lambda. Because the lambda is a diagonal matrix, no? The determinant is simply the product of the elements of the diagonal. And now the determinant of lambda is equal to the determinant of A. Okay, because the determinants of matrices are called, well, the determinant of a matrix is what is called, is one of the invariants of a matrix. It doesn't change by a similarity transformation. And this is a similar, similarity tra transformation. Okay, so therefore this is equal to one over square root of the determinant of A. Good? So then I, 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 I have proven what I wanted to prove. That one over square root of the determinant of a matrix A can be written in this way. 2P no? exponential of minus one half X A X. Good. I guess you have seen this thing. For the people who have seen this thing, I apologize. For the people who have not seen this thing, You'll see why, why we need this. Very good. Questions? Go ahead. This is, uh, well, with the, is the determinant. No, no, this would be without these uh, straight lines. Is the Jacobian of the transformation, which is a matrix. Yeah, so, so this notation is a weird notation that sometimes we introduce. Well, it's a compact notation, okay? So what this thing means is the following. So this is actually a matrix, right? So I have the, the, the partial derivative of x with respect to x prime. So this is a matrix that if I take the entry ij of this matrix, what it means is this. It means the partial derivative of xi with respect to xj prime. Yeah? Since the transformation is the linear transformation I mentioned before, this is precisely the matrix of the linear transformation. The matrix is O. And the determinant of O is plus minus one. Yeah. More questions about notation or any other thing? Ah, okay, very good. So, uh, exercise now. I'll leave you with an exercise, which is, which is the following one. Suppose now I have the following object. I have the integral, in dimensional integral dnx divided by 2 pi to the power n divided by 2 of the exponential of minus 1 half x transpose a s 
x plus b times x, where b is simply a vector. B is a vector in Rn. Yeah? And we will use this in at some point, so it's, it's useful to, to write it down. So in, 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 in condensed matter physics or field theory, this B is what is called a generate, generating field. It's called a generating field. Or in probability theory, uh, if this would be, uh, would be a measure, which is a measure, it's a Gaussian measure. So this is the moment generating function. Okay, it's as simple as that. And the logarithm of this would be the moment, uh, the, uh, the, the cumulant generating function. Okay. So this, from one point of view, is simply from physics it's a generating field. And in probability, this would be the field or the variable that generates moments. Um, variable that generates. Uh, the, let's say, m moment of a distribution. In this case, the distribution is, is Gaussian. Right. Also, for some weird reason, because these things sometimes happen, for some weird reason, this has an, another name, which is called the hubbard stratonovich transformation. Very useful also in condensed matter physics. Very, very useful for other reasons. Okay, this is also called, but the result is called the hubbard Stratonovich transformation. That may I may tell you why it is a cool trick. And what is the result of this? The result of this is simply the following. So this is equal to the exponential of um, one half b transpose the inverse of a b divided by the square root of the determinant of a. This is, a, this is a one, okay? And this is transpose, <laughs> I apologize. So the, this is the inverse of A, which is the matrix that appears here. Uh, so this is one half the, the scalar product of B with A inverse of B. Oh, pardon, of B inverse of A with B. Yeah? So how do you prove this? I'll leave it as an exercise, okay? Do you know why this, why this is a cool trick? You see, uh, you see it in reverse, why this, uh, this Hubbard Stratonovich transformation is a very cool trick? That's right, that's right, because sometimes it happens, yeah, sometimes it happens that you have something quadratic and you don't know what to do with it. If you do the, the transformation the other way around, what is quadratic becomes linear. Okay? Very good, so let me see. Okay, final case that uh, we will need for the case of a spectral density of non-emission matrices is the following one. Now suppose that, I'm using the same letters, I apologize, suppose that now a is a matrix, n times n matrix, is n times n matrix, actually complex matrix. And the only thing you ask for it is the determinant of A is different from zero. Okay, it's the only condition. Suppose that the determinant of A is different from zero. It can have real eigenvalues, complex eigenvalues, mix of then two, just this condition. Now, you can prove that one divided by the determinant of A can be written as follows, as the integral, as the product I from one to capital N of this set I, this set I complex two pi I 
of the exponential of minus the sum of i and j from 1 to n of set i bar a i j set j. Right? Where set i and set i bar are complex numbers. And if, so let me see, if uh, I do a slight modification of this, I'm going to do it here. If I introduce now a couple of complex vectors, a bi, bi bar, a bunch of them, I have, I can write that, let me see, the exponential of, Uh, the sum, mm, that's right, the sum for i and j of b i bar a minus 1 i j b j divided by the determinant of a, this is equal to the integral for, of the product of i from 1 to n, this set i, this set i bar divided by 2 pi i, this exponential thing here, the sum of i and j from 1 to n, set i bar a i j set j, put this thing below, plus the sum for i for 1 to n of b i bar set i plus b i set j bar. And again, in this case, this is the equivalent of the Howard noise transformation the other way around, or this would be, or this Bs, you have a pair of them. These again are generating fields. Of course, this has no meaning of measure because it might be complex, but sometimes you call it measure. <clears throat> so this would be again generating fields. Good, so I'm going to let you as an exercise to prove this. Uh, so please do it because I might ask it in the exam, okay? So I'll leave this thing as an exercise. Yes, it's without the square root. So in some cases, instead of having the square root of determinants, you have determinants. You, you, you will use this trick to represent that in terms of an integral. Even you have a representation, an integral representation of using Grassmann variables, but I'm not going to use that. Is, that that's too much. More questions? It's, it's not, it's, it's in the whole, uh, so you have to understand, I'll let you to work it out. Okay. Because you have to understand to understand what this thing means. So it's better to take the real to, 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 to put okay, that set i is equal to xi plus real and imaginary part. So what this thing means is you are integrating over the real part from minus infinity to infinity, the imaginary part, sorry, from minus infinity to infinity, etc. Cetera, et cetera. This is what it this is what it means. It's two pi i. Yes, you put it in such a way that when you go to the, the real and the, the imaginary part, the i disappears, and the square, one square root of two pi i goes to the real part, and the other one goes to the imaginary part, so you have the factors of the corresponding complex, uh, sorry, Gaussian integrals. Good, questions? In this case, yes. In this case, still a, yeah, asymmetric. A is asymmetric matrix. In this case, it doesn't have to be. 
But when you do the derivations, you have to pay attention of the conditions you need for to, you know, to find this expression, and you'll realize that must, must, has to be, must be symmetric in this case. More questions? Okay, uh, what time is it? You tired? Uh, it's the first day, you cannot say that you are tired. <laughs> yeah, a, a couple of more things, I think we finish for today. And maybe, uh, maybe we do some exercises, I don't know, we'll see. So, useful tricks now regarding Dirac deltas and heavy side step functions that we are going to use a lot. So this would be a uh, useful expressions in our case for Dirac deltas and heavy side functions. Well, I'll refer here, here to heavy side functions. It's just a step function. It's not the theta functions, theta heavy side functions. So. Um, okay, so the only expressions, the only results we are going to need, I think, are the following ones. The first one is the following. Suppose you have the following expression. So you have the limit when eta goes to zero plus of one divided, one, one divided by x minus i eta. So I claim that this is equal in the sense of distributions to the principal Cauchy part of one divided by one divided by x plus i pi Dirac delta. So what means this equal with a d? It means equality in sense of distribution. So that means you take you take well-behaved functions. I'm not going to do the details of the theory. So what this thing means is you take well-behaved well function, suppose that this is a well-behaved function, whatever that is, that means, and then you calculate the limit when n goes to zero plus of the integral of dx, this function phi of x, divided by x minus i eta. The, this symbol, equal in the sense of distributions, means that you have to have equality for integrals. This, this uh, operation applied to integrals. So if this expression, if this function is, is well behaved, you can, you can show that this is equal to the principal Cauchy part of one of pi of x divided by x plus i pi pi of zero where this is the uh, Cauchy principal part. What this thing means is the following. This means it's equal to the limit of epsilon going to zero of something like this is um, so you take, how can I put this? Let's put it like this, limit of, well. sorry? P means, uh, means a pre, uh, Cauchy principal part, which I'm going to explain what it, what it means in notation, okay? So the principal, uh, the Cauchy principal part of an integral is, means the following, okay? Again, this integral is from minus infinity to infinity, for instance. So what you do is simply you regularize and you take out the part where the integral diverges, which is in x equal to zero. So do you, you make the limit when epsilon goes to zero of the integral from minus infinity to minus epsilon, pi of x, x, I'm missing here the x. 
plus the integral from, uh, from epsilon to infinity, phi of x, x dx. This is, this is what this symbol means. Okay. This is a theorem that goes under the name uh, sokowski plemel theorem. And actually, it's not very difficult to prove. I'll let you to, to prove it. Good? Go ahead. What, means, what this notation means? This is what is called Cauchy principal part. Sometimes you have that integral of an integral diverges, but this divergence can be, can be removed. So suppose that you have an integral let me let me let me do it here. Let's do it for simplicity, like from minus infinity to infinity. Suppose you have a definite integral f of x, and sometimes it happens that the integral integral the, uh, sorry the integral diverges, and sometimes even though the integral integral diverges, the integral can be can be finite. So suppose that uh, the limit when x goes to x zero of f of, uh, f of x is equal is equal to infinity, for instance. Yeah. So then, what what you do with this integral? Uh, sometimes, what the best thing to do is to do the following. Okay. You define a new integral that is you integrate around the singularity. For instance, you do the integral from minus infinity to x0 minus epsilon 1 of f of x dx plus the integral from x0 plus epsilon 2 up to infinity of f of x dx. Yeah? So you, 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 you remove the, the singularity of the integral. Okay? And the way you remove it might be, might be, might be might be different from the left and from the right. Then you take the limit when epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 go to 0 of this object. And then you see what happens. OK? In the case where epsilon 1 is equal to epsilon 2, that means you approach the singularity at the same rate. This is called a Cauchy principal part or Cauchy principal value. When epsilon one is equal to epsilon two, because there are ways, different ways to remove this singularity, when, this, uh, when these two guys are the same thing, the result of this integral is called Cauchy principal value or Cauchy principal part. Good. More questions? In this case, in this case, since I said that phi of x is a very well-behaved function, that means essentially that it's C infinity, okay? It doesn't have singularities. So the only singularity that can come is from the de denominator. So since I'm applying the principal Cauchy part of this, the singularity is at x equal to zero. You go to your supervisor and you tell him what you what you ask me to do diverges. What, what can I do, boss? Yeah. So, but again, if you start with a problem which is well defined, unless you screw up in the derivation, this this singularity has to mean something. Okay. Remove it or understand it. More questions. For the problems we are going to do, uh, Chris, uh, this will not happen, but maybe in the future it might happen that you find you know, infinities somewhere. More questions? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, so, uh, yeah. This appears, for instance, when you do, for instance, it depends on the context, but I know what you, uh, what you, uh, what you mean. So what happens in that case is that suppose that you have, that's a very good point, suppose that you have an integral that goes from minus infinity to infinity to this, to this one, and you have in the denominator this. Or the thing you, you, you have before, you have x minus i epsilon, or i eta. Then you can uh, do this integral going to the complex plane. You know these tricks, right? You go to the integral, go to the complex plane, so you complexify the integral, and, and there is a theorem or, or, or a, a lemma, it's called Jordan's lemma, that tells you that depending on where the singularity, the poly is, at, and how you close, the contribution that comes from a semicircle, when the semicircle goes to infinity, is zero. Yeah? So you know what I mean, yeah? No, normally, no, normally you, that, that comes from, from another part, yeah? And actually, actually, this theorem, you can prove it this way, actually. Yeah, you can complexify, use, uh, you know, residues theorem, et cetera, et cetera. But one thing I, I need to point out, because sometimes when students, they do this, the way they close is for the integral to give you something different from zero. And this, this, this you, you don't do this, right? So what you are mentioning, I don't think we are going to find this thing, but maybe it's, it's worth to mention. So suppose you have an integral the following one, right? So you have an integral from minus infinity to infinity of phi of x, x minus i, right? Uh, so you are doing an integral in the real line of this function, phi of x. But in the complex plane, and this is a very well-behaved function, but in the complex plane, you have a pole, a single single pole at uh, here, right? And actually, let us do it. Let us do it more fancy. So you have a pole here, x zero. Yeah, and you want to resolve this integral. So what what you do? What you do is you say, ah, oh, okay. So what I'm going to do? I'm going to first consider a, a finite integral from minus r to r, and the integral goes from minus r to r. Yeah, so what I do is I take the integral from minus r to r of phi of x, s minus x zero minus eta zero, and I want, I want to do the limit r going to infinity, because the integral that I'm interested in is this one. But first I do it finite. And then what you do, you complexify the integral. No? So you say, ah, so this is related to, I'm going to do the integral in the complex plane, Missing the x all the time. Set. Set minus x here. And what is the, and I choose a closed path, right? What is the closed path I choose? Oh, no, that's not true. Right? So you don't choose the, the path that encloses the pole. You choose the path that makes that the integral the, of the semicircle goes to zero, okay? And that depends on the integral. So you never choose a path, so to, you know? You say, ah, if the pole is, is, is above, I'm going to choose this one, because I want to apply a residue theorem. No, it doesn't work that, work that way. Because in the limit, when r goes to infinity, you want to this integral to go to zero, because you, this is the integral you're, you're interested in. So, the, uh, so the, the way you close the path is such that then when you go to, this, uh, to the semicircle, you can apply Jordan's lemma, and that integral would go to zero when r goes to infinity. Okay. More questions? Depends on, the, depends on the function. Okay, five more minutes. Uh, Okay, one more, um, one more um, useful expression, in this case, for the heavy side function. So the idea is the following. Suppose that you have the complex plane. And I think about the logarithm of set. Okay. You know that this function uh, is, uh, 
has a, what is called, a branch cut at zero. It's a, uh, a branch cut. And you can put it to go to, from zero in the real axis, the negative real axis, to minus infinity. In such a way that if I approach the logarithm from one side to, or the other, there is a jump of 2 pi i. Yeah? So if I take the logarithm, suppose that this is x plus i eta, and I compare the logarithm of x plus i eta with the one below, okay? x of minus i eta, and I apply the logarithm to these two, two things, I make eta going to zero, and I notice that there is a jump of 2 pi i but only if eta is in the, in the negative part. Sorry, if x is in the negative part. If it's in the positive part, this is not true because here there is no jump. So therefore, I can say that the theta function of the step function of theta minus x is equal to the limit of eta going to zero plus of the logarithm of x plus i eta minus the logarithm of x minus i eta. Okay. I think I put it correct. Did I put correct the signs? Work it out. Yeah? And, and this is a theta the, the heavy side theta function. It's zero when the argument is negative and one when the argument is positive, and when x is equal to one, flip a coin and decide. It doesn't matter for, that, for, most, for most cases. Yeah. You see this equality here? Yeah. If x is negative, what happens if you are taking this x, which is in the negative part, uh, and I'm comparing x above and below the branch cut. And if I play the logarithm, if I take the logarithm, there is a jump of 2 pi i. Ah, sorry, I forgot. Yeah, I know what you are. You were confused. This is the limit of n eta going, going to 0 plus 1 divided by 2 pi i. Now, okay? There is a jump of 2 pi i between the values of the logarithm above and below. If I divide it by 2 pi i, this goes to 1 when x is negative. And on the other side, there is no jump. So this is zero. Good. Questions? Sorry? In the, uh, the definition of the logarithm, the complex plane, is not has a, a, a special singularity at zero. This is called a, it's called a, it's called a branch cut, right? It's, it's called a branch singularity, and it has a cut okay, that goes from the singularity at zero to the infinity. So that means that in this line, the, the, the logarithm is not well defined. And if you compare the logarithm above and below, there is a, there is a difference. Yeah, so no, what happens is the following, and this is, uh, this is another thing. So if you now take one of the, what is called a, a Riemann sheet, yeah, so what happens, you can uh, define what is called the, the principal value of the logarithm, which is not the same as the principal value of Cauchy before. And, and what happens is that you take multiple sheets in the complex plane, and when you go around, here, if you stay in the, in the same sheet, there is a jump of 2 pi i, but you, you glue this sheet with another copy in the complex plane, and it happens that this function, which is not defined in one copy of the complex plane, is well defined in infinite copies of the complex plane. But if you, if you stay in the same sheet, which I think this is called a Riemann sheet, yeah, there is a jump. The same happens with other singularities. For instance, when you have a, a, a square root, 
More questions? Okay, so that's it. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. See you at 7 p.m. Uh, for the get-together here.